listen, there are many, many aspects to the present situation and a lot of uh, anger and some fear and uh, even more bewilderment and uh, all, all of those I share. And there are going to be other occasions on which uh, one will speak in a different vein and uh, the anger will perhaps be first and foremost. Uh, but I thought today I would um, be rather academic about it all um, and speak to the borderline between public and private in a university like ours and how that borderline might be altered in a UDOF future, as I understand his intentions. I want to speak as a historian and, and, and a, a, on this occasion at least as a realist, or try to be. Um, some of us believe that the University of California is still a public university, a great public university with a public mission and that this character is under threat. But I'm a historian. The last thing I believe from the historical record is that there ever has been or ever could be a time when there was something called a public university, bravely independent, recognized as a public trust, existing within a stable and healthy public sphere. And that this meant the university was somehow magically immune from the pressures and patronage of the powers that be. It's never been like that. Uh, I recommend everyone to go inside the glorious and profoundly original uh, front hall of the Hearst School of Mining and read <laughs> the extraordinary plaque uh, dedicated to uh, Mr. Hearst himself. Um, the, uh, uh, declared on that plaque to be a plain man and a minor. <laughs> um, but of course, in a way, I'm steering close to the wind here because the argument of some of the university's uh, most dreary contemporary hacks is that, of course, there's always been private money and uh, all this fuss is blown completely out of proportion. I'm going to try and speak against that. Well, first of all, the university has always, as an institution, historically, defined and redefined itself in difficult relation to those who resented its freedom and, or expected its services. Um, historically speaking, I suppose the three great examples of that uh, are the church, I mean preeminently the church, uh, the church, the state, and the party. You could say of the church especially that the university came to be a determinate part of the social order, and it came to be very gradually and unevenly in and through its claim to generate a knowledge not immediately subject to the church and its monopoly of truth. If we look around for a modern-day equivalent of the church, I think it's not far to seek. In my view, uh, it is the unprecedented concentration of international corporate wealth that dominates our social life. Of course, those international corporations do not claim anymore a monopoly of truth. But they are aiming, to borrow a phrase from the past, to own and control the commanding heights of the high-tech information economy. Of course they are. If they didn't try, they would have to answer to their shareholders. They're in the business of profiting from uh, the very latest economic technological developments. They're out to incorporate the symbol managers, that's you and me and uh, those of you who are you know, training to uh, be the same. 
uh, they're out above all to fence off the remaining commons of knowledge, and God knows it's shrunken and shrunken, to fence off that remaining commons of knowledge and turn it into saleable lots of intellectual property. That's what corporations are about, all right? Uh, um, it's very interesting that we're having this dialogue on campus uh, just a week after the fascinating dialogue in the Supreme Court about the nature of corporations, what their interests are, uh, whether or not the state needs protection or the society needs protection against their uh, possible absolute dominance over political discourse. Well, again, I'm a realist. Uh, one side of me um, says, maybe it's my uh, residual uh, Marxist pessimism, uh, that this process is irresistible in its main lines, uh, that in many ways it has already happened and we're fighting a rearguard action. But, don't despair, uh, the question then follows, what is the argument about public versus private at a university like Berkeley about? I don't think it's about the desirability or not of private, corporate, or federal funding for specific projects. That's here. It always has been here. Um, uh, and we utterly fool ourselves if we want to wish it away. It's about the point at which funding of this kind from these kind of sources changes the character of area after area of the university's activity and invades and instrumentalizes the university's central mission. The production of knowledge, the making of radical thought, critical thought, uh, the making available to the citizenry of our knowledge achievements. There are at least Two aspects to this. Let, let, and let me speak to them briefly.